Welcome to The Brass Junkies, a podcast from the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network featuring interviews with the world's greatest brass players by two thoroughly average ones, Lance LaDuke and myself, Andrew Hitz. Today's episode features David Zirkel of the University of Georgia. He tells us all about his time playing in military bands and about his transition to teaching college, which eventually led him to the University of Georgia. He also talks about playing in the brass band of Battle Creek and about his approach to teaching. He tells us all about it next. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Brass Junkies. I am one of your hosts, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by my incredibly talented and gifted and uh, unique co-host, Lance LeDuc. How are you doing this morning, Lance? Eh. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, before, um, before, before we introduce our guest... Uh, who is a fellow tuba player, uh, who is a lot better at the tuba than me, which kind of pisses me off, but uh, but we had him on in spite of that. Uh, I wanted to um, do the usual pitch. If you could go to the iTunes store and give us a rating, uh, and if you could leave us a review, which a number of you have, uh, they're, they're slowly climbing. Uh, that just helps um, a lot of people find the podcast, and uh, we very much appreciate that, even if Lance doesn't sound happy to be here. <laughs> Um, that's just because he's busy throwing things around his office, evidently. Um, so, uh, also, uh, I wanted to right off the top, uh, thank our, uh, two producers, uh, Buddy Deschler and Austin Boyer, um, for, uh, everything that they do. They are, uh, unable to join us, uh, today on the call. Uh, Lance, do you know where they are? I do. This is actually my fault. I, uh, well, they're both trumpet players and, um, I told them that there was this mouthpiece convention <laughs> in uh, in Provo, Utah, <laughs> and but it was like they were trying this new like cutting edge thing. So it's like way on the down low, and you had to only you had to be on the inside to know that the thing was going on. So you're just supposed to show up in the ho- this hotel lobby in downtown Provo and just start going up to people at random and asking what kind of mouthpiece they play. So there, so I think there. The last I heard, of one was trying to get enough bail money to get the other one out. Um, so I don't know how that's turned out, but uh, I, I thought it was kind of funny. They took a train to get there, which is kind of funny because um, <clears throat> in the middle of the night on the train, uh, it was like really early in the morning, and this older lady uh, got up and. <laughs> blessed them all and told them that they should have a, a good holiday and then <laughs> proceeded to leave with uh, both of their suitcases. So That's a sad story. That's <laughs> sad. That is a sad story. So that's why they couldn't be with us today. All so, right. So the answer is that they are in a hotel lobby in Provo, Utah, asking people what, what mouthpiece they play on. That, right. Okay, good. That was a... That was a long walk for a short drink, but all right, we'll take it. So, You've got trumpet players. Yeah, well, there is that. So, All right, well, uh, without, without further ado, uh, our guest for this episode of the Brass Junkies is a very good friend of ours who coincidentally uh, just took a train trip uh, in which uh, in the middle of the Wait, night... what? Yeah, in the, in the middle of the night... Uh, at 4.30 a.m. in Spartanburg, a woman who was getting off of the train uh, shouted to the sleeping car to have a happy Thanksgiving and then stole his suitcase inadvertently, uh, which is re- quite a coincidence. Uh, what a coincidence. Yeah, this is the uh, tuba professor, tuba euphonium, sorry, at the University of Georgia. Uh, and he plays. Uh, he's played with countless symphonies, and he plays with the brass band of Battle Creek. And he used to be uh, in the army band, and the blah 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 blah. His resume is uh, is daunting. Uh, David Zirkel, how are you doing this morning, David? Doing great, guys. How about you? Uh, doing fine. Doing better than you getting your luggage stolen by some eighty year old woman. It's all good. It's all. <laughs> it's all good. You sound a little bitter, man. No, I buy. If I put the right spin on this, I got to buy some new jeans out of this deal and, oh, I got, you fancy and, I have, now. and i have doubles for toiletries now so it's awesome D- doubles for toilet are you talking in code <laughs> yeah what is, what is, what's, what's going on um so uh, i thought that we could start this by by you telling us about the um lance reaching out to ask you if you would be interested in being a guest on the podcast 
It was, was really, nice, wasn't it? It was really touching. It was really touching. It was one of those moments where I thought to myself, you know, this is, you know, this is all beginning to pay off. This is all this. <laughs> finally all this, made it. I finally made it. So I get a, I get an email from Lance that says, "Hey, would you be interested in being on uh, the Brass Junkies podcast? We'd l- like to get you sometime, sometime on Saturday, if that's a possibility. And if not, you're a dick." <laughs> See? Well, it- so. I, you know, f- feeling somewhat involved with my own self-esteem, I, 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 went with, I, went, I, went, I went with A. <laughs> you're, you're somewhat involved with your self-esteem. That's, that's really I like funny. that. That's yes. pretty good. Who else is involved? <laughs> oh, oh, my God. So sh- how long is the show? Uh, <laughs> as long as you need, David. We're here for you. <laughs> Man. Lance, it's actually an intervention, David. We didn't. <laughs> now that we have you here, Lance, we we have a problem. Our guest just had the funniest line of the whole podcast, and it was only five <laughs> minutes in. So, do we just pack it up, or do we? Just, oh, do we just, the streak's alive. We're the, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's not usually five minutes in. That's what Good I'm saying. Point. It's okay. like yeah, it's just kind of early for that. So, anyway, all right. So now, Lance and I will not be funny. All right, um, where are you right now? I'm actually in Battle Creek, sitting in my hotel room in the McCamley Plaza Hotel, and uh, we had a concert last night in Troy, Michigan, and uh, another Sweet. one tonight in Battle Creek. And it was a good, it was a great show last night. It's a lot of fun. I always kind of pinch myself playing in this band because it's uh, it's just full of great, great players. We're we're doing an arrangement of um, Pines of Rome for Brass Band, which is daunting, but it's great because the t- Tubas are tacit in the first movement, and it's chaos for the rest of the band. And I just kind of sit back and listen to everything that's going on and just go, well, why am I sitting in this chair? Uh, because it's just amazing, kind of the, the level of playing for a group that gets together twice a year and then picks up like they never left off. So it's a lot of fun. I heard from some of the other members in the band who wanted to know why you were in that chair as well, but I don't know if that's <laughs> yeah. hurt. And we're talking about the Brass Band of Battle Creek. I don't know if we, we yeah. actually mentioned that part, yeah, right? Yeah, Brass Band of Battle Creek, yeah. And yeah. so uh, how long have you been playing with the group? It's been about 10 years. It's been about 10 years. I think that, uh, Lance, when did you leave the group? I, 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 let's see. Uh, I was playing in the mid to late 90s. I can't remember if I made it into the 2000s or not. I was probably there five, six years, went to England and all that stuff. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great. I got, I got a call to, to come. I think it was when Sam decided to leave the band. And mm-hmm. I, I got a call to, to come up and play. And I think they were maybe trying people on for size. And, um, and uh, it, was, <laughs> it was great. It was a, it was a summer gig. And, um, and the airlines destroyed my tuba on the, on the way in. Awesome. And so I, so I showed up to rehearse. I'll never, I'll never forget it. I walked into the rehearsal in this high school uh, band room, and here I am with my my tuba that's just been beat to hell. And uh, the first person, the first person I see is Wycliffe Gordon, and he goes, <gasps> "What happened?" <laughs> <laughs> and then you showed him your tuba, right? Yeah. And then, no, yeah. Actually, no, that, was, that was what happened for you to be here. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so it was great because the the Gray brothers who run the band um, they took care of me and took care of the instrument quickly. I mean, I did the first rehearsal with a with a, a, a dinged up tuba, and then immediately after that they um, they took it after rehearsal. And by the time the next rehearsal happened, I, it was as good as new. So it's great. It's really a fantastic group to play in, and uh, it was a little spooky uh, recently. There was some. The we the band relies heavily on um, support from the Kellogg Foundation, and uh, they were deciding to maybe go a different direction with some of their philanthropy. But there was such an outpouring of support for the band because it really is quite a unique thing that they've uh, re-upped on their commitment to the band, and and I think we're going to be around for a little bit longer. That's good news. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's really great. Who's the rest of the super section? Oh, the rest of the stupid section is uh, Phil. I sit next to Phil Cinder, who, for the record, is one of the finest tuba players on the face of the planet. Man, that guy never misses, and he just plays with such a beautiful sound. Uh, 
So he's my partner in the B flat tubas, which we play on C tubas. And then um, Marty Erickson uh, plays E flat tuba, and Les Niche plays E flat tuba. And Les is uh, Les is really one of my favorite young tuba players. I, I grew up a uh, I grew up a well I grew up I'm still growing up, and I am still a devotee of John Fletcher's tuba playing. In my mind, that's the first tuba playing that I heard when I was a kiddo. And uh, I listened to that and thought, well, this is it. This is the model. This is what I want to sound like. And for the rest of my life, it hasn't been trying to be the best tuba player in my high school band or the best tuba player in the county or the best tuba player at college or the best tuba player in the army band or the best tuba player on the in Athens, Clark County, Georgia. It's been about trying to reach for the goal of trying to sound like John Fletcher. And it's that model has really stuck in my head. And I bring up Fletch because of this. Of all the people I've heard operate E-flat tubas, Les Niche, in my mind, is the guy who comes absolutely the closest to sounding like Fletcher. Just a really beautiful, beautiful player. So anyway, the the brass band is, is a hoot, really, because it's... Uh, it gives me a chance to do section playing. And as tuba players, we don't really have a lot of opportunities to do section playing. Uh, and I just, I, frankly, it's kind of the, the, my favorite kind of playing to do. And it's, uh, it's really, in, really enjoyable. It's hard to wipe the smile off my face when I'm there. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. That was, so, so what's the question again? What? <laughs> we asked what kind of mouthpiece you play. No. <laughs> You're, I haven't heard anything since you talked about your tuba getting beat up because I, 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 my tick is back. I'm just remembering all of the times. There was one, maybe four years ago, there was a one-month period where I had to visit repair shops in Anchorage, Alaska, Hong Kong, and Linz, Austria, because oh. the, the flights to all three places made the valves not work anymore, um, which was uh, awesome. And that was with an expensive flight case and everything. So good times. I didn't hear anything you said after that. Yeah, it's okay. At least the flight case weighs 600 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's just, yeah, the, the joys of air travel as a tuba player. Every time that I see somebody who uh, has a, a blog post about like ultralight uh, traveling. Um, it just, it makes me want to murder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. Right. I will probably want to edit that out in case I ever do murder and then <laughs> uh, it'll be premeditated. But, but <laughs> anywho, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> so uh, what rep are you playing in this concert other than uh, Pines of Rome, which you get to rest during? Yeah, which which is great, which is the only rest we get. Actually, it's the the program is um, it's pretty light. It's a hol it's a holiday theme. Uh, we have so many great uh, people who stand up and do solos with the band in the cornet section this time. Rex Richardson is doing a big long uh, uh, Children of Sanchez arrangement. Marshall Jilks is sitting in on trombone this time, and boy, is that guy spooky in terms of his playing. I mean, it's just really f f fantastic playing. And then Rich Kelly is getting up and doing a, an old uh, uh, old Louis Armstrong standard, Is That You, Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. And uh, he sings and plays, and it's really beautiful. And uh, and uh, so we, we have quite a few soloists who are getting up and playing, but it's a lot of Christmas fair. Um, it's a pretty light program in terms of uh, we we the band recently appointed uh, Michael Garassi, who's the now he's been appointed as the music director. We haven't had a really regular uh, guy on the podium since Gould was doing it, and I always loved playing him for Mark. I mean, he was uh, he, he you know Mark he he gets yeah. bra he gets brass players totally <laughs> at the at the, ba at the bassist level, and um, that's a polite and, way to put that. <laughs> <laughs> but but he was an extraordinary musician, and uh, I thought the the band always sounded phenomenal when Mark was in front of the group. Uh, and then we we had a, a series of conductors, all of whom did a really nice job. But I, I think there was a little clamor in the band for having kind of a regular face in front of the group. So we so we kind of knew what to expect, and we knew where the watermark was. And uh, Michael Garassi had done a few programs. Um, and uh, he got along great with the band and did, always did exciting programming and always uh, um, made the band sit up straight and pay attention. And 
I think they they saw that this was a really nice fit, and they appointed him the music director. So he'll be that he'll he'll be in charge of the band for a little bit of time here. There you go. Which is nice. It's always Wait. nice to know what to expect, you know. <laughs> well, with a conductor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what that was implied. <laughs> I expe- I expect to not look at them very often. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been? Yeah. So exactly. let's talk about what's your what's your most people who are listening to this already know, but why don't you explain to us what your main gig is when you're not playing with the brass band of Battle Creek or riding trains? What are you doing? The other 50, 50 one and a half weeks of the year. Right. Um, yeah, I, I'm currently the tuba euphonium professor at the University of Georgia in Athens, and I've been there since the year 2000. Um, um, Athens is a groovy little town. It's a great college town. The school of music is uh, in pretty good shape and getting stronger all the time. We've, we, I don't know if you've heard, we hired this guy to teach the trumpet, and it's, it's pretty exciting. My, my, my new across-the-hall partner is Phil Smith, and, uh, and f- he's brought a, a certain level of excitement and uh, enthusiasm to not only the brass area of the school, but kind of the whole university community. Um, uh, he's doing a lot of stuff with, the, with uh, actually starting a British-style brass band at UGA, and the students who sit in that group are, are all super hyped about what, what a great experience it is. Um, so I've been there for 15 years, and I, I really love teaching. I mean, I really love teaching. When I was, you know, I, I'll digress here a little bit. You know, I like you, Lance, I spent a little time in the military band. I was in the Army field band for three years, and then in the Army band downtown, I traded my bus seat in for a sousaphone. Um, <laughs> so I did that for eight years um, and it became evident to me pretty quick, and I'm very thankful for the time that I had in the military bands. It was it was a good experience, even though I might have been too much of an angry young buck to um, to accept that at the time that it was a great experience. It was, in fact, a great experience. But but a large part of my job when I was in the army band was to stand very very still, <laughs> and, and and when you have have lots of time to stand very, very still, it leaves lots of time for self-reflection. <laughs> and when you think of things... I that's wonder, why That's why you're so invested in your... I, what was it? Your, I, I your, wonder if there's more to life than standing very, very still. <laughs> and, after, and after eight years of thinking that, I think I came up with, there has to be. And so I... Um, this wasn't even on a gig, right? They just told you on a regular basis. <laughs> and I was, we just need you to go over there and stand very, very still. In the shower. <laughs> that was my weekend duty. <laughs> so anyway, I... Um, he said duty. So I, I started... I did, a, I did my master's when I was in Maryland and, um, and uh, started applying for college jobs. And uh, it's... Um, I think my story could be one that's... Um, that has as one of the key words, perseverance. Um, I applied for a lot of college jobs, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and, um, I, it was funny. My, my resume never moved to the, um, to the let's keep going pile until I started applying for bigger schools. I found that the smaller the school I applied for, the, the more, um, wrapped up they were in the DMA. And, um, isn't that funny? Yeah, well, it's a different. It's another podcast altogether. Yeah, um, right. Yes, but um, but anyway, I I um, <laughs> I had my first job interview um, at Ohio State University, and and uh, it was very funny. Um, that was a good cast of characters that was in to interview for that position, but it was for my very first. Ex- experience interviewing for a full time position, and so you know, just get in front of the committee, and they say, well. Why do you want to leave the Army Band to teach at Ohio State University? And I, my answer was, I've been trying to dot the I in Army for 11 years now, and it's just not going very well. <laughs> That's a pretty good line. That is a pretty good line. Yeah, I didn't get the, I didn't get the job. Uh, not no, that good a line. No, no, Grandma. I didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I anyway. Jan Duga on at some point. Jan Duga was, the, was in the Air Force Band with me in the tube section. She was right. the first female to yeah. dot the I in Script, Ohio. My favorite dotting dotting of the I thing is the YouTube video of the sousaphone guy taking out the camera operator. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> That's really funny. It, it's, it's hilarious. He's, I think he even warned the guy, watch out. 
And then he just totally bam. bam. <laughs> <laughs> It makes it makes me giggle. <laughs> and so anyway, I I um I was my entry into college teaching was um when one of my old mentors, Ed Livingston, who taught for a million years at Illinois State University, announced his retirement and he called me up and said, Sir, I I hope you'll apply for this job. And, and um and so I did and I and I went out and uh taught that was my departure point from the army as I moved from Fairfax, Virginia to normal Illinois. And, um, I had a great time teaching there for three years. It was really, a, it was really a great experience. Um, this, that was a school in my mind that was kind of like, remember the old Avis commercials? We try harder. Um, that was that school. It was, everybody kind of had the attitude of, well, the, the university as a whole kind of had an inferiority complex. It kind of, from the president of the university to the freshman walk on the campus, you could have put a tattoo across their forehead that said, we're not the U of I. And I think that this, the school kind of ran with this inferiority complex a little bit. But the beautiful thing was the music department said, screw that noise. We're better than the U of I. And I, I don't know whether, that, whether or not that's true, they kind of ran with the attitude of, we have something very special here and let's make it as special as it can be. So it was great colleagues, um, um, good, good students. And, uh, it was a nice situation. And then, um, in 2000, Dave Randolph, unfortunately passed away, um, from leukemia at a very, very early age. And Dave was the kind of a revered teacher at the university of Georgia. And I didn't know much about the university of Georgia. I visited there once when I was in field band, when I was in, the, when I was in the field band, we, I traveled 50 States in three years. So I saw everywhere. And my, 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 uh, when I left the field band, I was like, there are lots of places that I'd like to live, man. I'd love to live in Portland, Oregon, or, or Colorado Springs, Colorado, or, Middlebury, Vermont, or, you know, I went to all these places where I really remember the town. And being road guys, you know this, you remember towns based on what you ate there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. So, so anyway, I love places that I wanted to live, but I only knew in my mind, all I know is that I don't want to live in the deep south. Ta-da! <laughs> so it's funny, funny how life happens. So, um, so <laughs> I, I applied for the job at UGA, not because I was itching to get out of Illinois, because I really did like my situation there. It was really, an, I had great colleagues, good students. Um, but it was, uh, part of it, what intrigued me was um, Fred Mills was on the faculty, and uh, I had, I, you know, one of my first real aha moments as a young kid, you know, I mentioned Fletcher is somebody who really inspired me, but f- uh, Owning Canadian brass records where listening to Fred and Ronnie play together, where I swear that they were the same person, you know, in terms of how well they played together. And, uh, and for, for me, those, no disrespect to the other members of the group, but for, for me, listening to what those two did to sound like one player, whether it smacked me upside the head as saying, hey, pay attention to this, but it really caught my attention. And uh, so I was intrigued by working with Fred. And Georgia had this lottery program, which they still have. It's just been cut a little bit, um, where if you were a Georgia resident and you had a 3.0 average coming out of high school, your tuition was free. And so, you know, one of the uphill battles that we had at Illinois was, um, at Illinois State, was scholarship money. There just was not much there was, it was a very small pie cut into tiny slivers. Um, and so when I thought, well, if all of the students can come to university for no tuition, that seems like a pretty good deal for, for recruiting talented kids. And it is a pretty good deal. The trick is, for some kids look at it and go, well, if it's free, how good can it be? Well, well it can be pretty good, actually. Um, so anyway... I uh, got down here. It was a very talented studio when I first showed up and um, just hit the ground running. And um, I have enjoyed my time there ever since. 
Hey, this is Lance. We'll get you right back to the interview in just a minute. I wanted to, first of all, thank you all for listening. You've been wonderful. We've got hundreds of you that are listening to every episode, and that's just great. It's very rewarding uh, to Andrew and me. And we wanted to let you know that if you're interested in helping us cover the costs associated with um, uh, recording and uploading and storing these podcasts, there's a quick and easy way for you to do that, and that's through a site called Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And at Patreon, if you sign up through that uh, site, you can pick a dollar amount, a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, however much you want. And every time we upload an episode, your account will be deducted for that amount. And you can set an upper limit per month or per year so that if we end up uploading additional content, uh, that you won't be charged uh, more than wherever you set that limit. You also will get access to um, some free downloads and back behind the scenes things that Andrew and I are working on uh, in preparing for future episodes. So if you're interested in helping out, we'd love to have you help you. Thank you very much for listening. Spread the word. Visit pedalnotemedia.com. Click on the donate button and we look forward to hearing from you soon. And now back to your regularly scheduled podcast already in progress. We were uh, just down uh, at the University of Georgia last month. Um, you had us in for three days, uh, which was which was really a blast. And um, just the your studio was just phenomenal. Um, the not just the level of playing, uh, but just also the level of uh, human being there. It's uh, just a it's fantastic. I I know that uh, Lance and I both just had a an, an incredible time there. So you got a really good thing going. Well, yeah, thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, I, you know, part of what I love so much about teaching is this, is that it's not, you know, it's the, the last priority that I have as a teacher is to create good tuba and good euphonium players. That's the last thing on my mind. The next thing on my mind is to help to create great musicians who just happen to play the tuba or euphonium. But then the first thing on my mind is is kind of the rare opportunity that teaching at a college level uh, presents, uh, and especially in a full-time capacity. Um, it's you, You're on campus from 8 to 5 every day, and, and you really have an opportunity to, to mentor kids and, and cr- try and help them along the way. Um, there's a lot, you know, I always tell kids when they interview, and I don't know if they believe me, but I always tell them this. I said, well, your audition is going to consist of a playing audition. Then I'm going to ask you some questions. We'll have a brief little interview. What happens in that interview is every bit as important, if not more important to me, than what comes out of their bell. Because I, I need to make sure that their, um, that their motivation is pure, that their interest is pure, that their desire is pure, and that uh, they that they're going about this um, for the right reasons and in the right way. So, uh, you know, part of my, I think that, uh, I, here, I'm going to sound like, I'm going to sound like Barack. I'm a community builder, but, uh, you know, but that's, um, but I really feel like that's a very primary objective with my job is to, is to create a good community of musicians, um, who, who support each other and thrive off of each other rather than, uh, feeling like they're in competition with one another. There's enough competition down the road without having four years of it while you're at school. Who needs that? Right. That was something that uh, Rex Martin uh, shares your exact same philosophy on all of that stuff from stocking the studio to um, <clears throat> to what you do once you're there. And uh, I remember uh, my first week where he was, you know, in the master class when he just, he told everyone, he said, look, he said, there's, like you just said, there's, plenty of time for competition down the road and you'll be competing against each other but what i what he, what he was adamant about was in 10 years if uh, two of you run into each other at an orchestral audition i want that to be a good thing you know you don't need to be best friends uh, but i i want that to be a good thing to say like oh there you know there she is there he is and have that be like a calming effect and not like oh no here comes here comes that person again and uh and it was it was great he and he led just like you do uh, i'm sure uh, he led by example, you know, just always treating everybody well. Yeah, well, it's a, it's you know, it's it's very funny. We the the term esprit de corps has has a, def, a couple different you know a couple different connotations, but I think the esprit de corps that we have in the studio at UGA is is more based on what we have as a family rather than if we're kicking ass and taking names uh, playing, you know, and, and so for me that that matters, and it's. Uh, 
And so it's a it's a great group of kids. It's real. I'm really blessed to have such a great group of kids there. So, well, and people are um, whether it's freelance work, the first people that uh, anyone who is contracting a gig, whether it's just someone who happens to be needing to fill out a gig or someone that is a contractor full time, the first people that they call are people that they are friends with and uh, people that they are obviously you have to be able to play the play the gig um, but uh, they they call people we all do we call people who we know and who we like and uh, so being a uh, being a great human being is uh, is incredibly important and then if you're going into the business side of things in terms of sales uh, people tend to um, do business with people who, whether it's buying products, whatever, from people that they either are friends with or feel like they're friends with, uh, you know, through through content, through whatever. So uh, the, the interview portion of your uh, audition process is, uh, is applicable to all aspects of a future career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. How do you feel, uh, well, do you feel like your um, teaching either approach or philosophy has changed or evolved over the years? And if so, in what ways? Hey, that's a good question, Lance. Thank you. Well, I, just, I woke up. I, was, I nodded off a little bit. <laughs> and uh, when I, I had this like moment. And, uh, Any yeah. 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 Um, well, I'll be quite honest with you. You know, when I was in, when I was in, um, DC, I did a little bit of adjunct teaching. I taught some at VCU, and I taught some at American, and I taught some um, at, uh, oh, wow, that was a long time ago. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really famous place that uh, yeah, yeah, loves yeah. having you there. Just, uh, just call I, it Juilliard. GW. So, um, so. Anyway, that was an adjunct situation, and you know when you're I, and I and I say this with all the love in my heart because I know that adjunct teachers uh, are no less invested in their students than full time um, uh, faculty. Uh, but when when you're teaching adjunct, especially in doing it in a city, um, it begins to be there. Your students are still a primary concern, but the other concern is where am I going to put my car? Mm -hmm. Am I going to make it there on time? Am I having to miss dinner tonight? Does my kid have a soccer game during this lesson? <laughs> I wonder if the student practiced this week, you know. And and, um, and so it was all of those things. I I taught some really nice kids, but it, it, at GW and at American, you know, kids are not going to those schools to be great great tuba players. You know, they're they've got they've got big brains in their heads, and they're they, they're aiming a little higher. Um, so what, uh, Man, when I first so started teaching at Illinois State, with the setup like that. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I first started teaching at Illinois State, I always tell the story that, uh, for my first semester teaching, it was, uh, the, the same thing would happen at the end of a lesson. You know, a kid would come in and play their lesson and they, and they'd play and we'd get stuff done. And then I'd walk them to the door and say, well, here's what we're going to do next week. And, and they'd say, okay, good, good deal. And so we'd say goodbye. And I'd walk them to the door. I'd open the door. And then I'd close the door behind them. And then the same conversation happened on both sides of the door. And that conversation was, what the hell just happened there? <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that happens with less frequency now than it, than it used to. Um, my teaching has changed. I, I, my teaching has changed a little. I would say it's just be. I'm a little smarter about what I'm teaching these days, and I'm a little bit more focused about what I'm trying to do. But from the out, from the get go, with me, um, teaching has always been about trying to always trying to create the most musical product with the with the, uh, the most beautiful sound and the greatest clarity with which you can play the music, and that's that. That's my mission statement, if, if I had one, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's really what my, my primary objectives are. And I, frankly, there are a lot of times where I feel like, hmm, here I'll get on the sofa here to answer this question. There are a lot of times when I feel like I don't necessarily nourish my kids with a lot of nuts and bolts um, technical stuff. I, I am not a big believer in teaching technique outside of musical context there has to be a reason why we're evolving there has to be a reason why our technique is evolving and whether that's an etude or whether that's a solo or whether that's an excerpt 
it's going to be a thing. But I, you know, I would rather eat a bowl full of glass than sit in a practice room and practice double tonguing and triple tonguing out of Arbenz for a, an hour um, with no musical context. We we don't we never picked up the instruments when we were younger because someday we wanted to play really cool exercises. And that's now that's that's not why we do it, you know. And so for me, there always has to be a, a musical reason why we're why we're approaching what we're doing on the on the instrument. So. There you go. Preach. Look at this guy. <laughs> Testify. <I love> <laughs> <laughs> well, here, let me ask a, 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 a I guess related or flip side of that. Do you feel like in the, say, this the 15 years you've been at Georgia, do you feel like there's been a, a change or uh, evolution or, I don't know, are, are there students coming with a different set of skills or attitudes or ideas? Or has it been pretty much the way it was in 2000? No, no, no. It's different. It's, it's, it's definitely different. I'm um, I'm always astounded. You know, frankly, I'm astounded by by some of the things that my students can do. You know, I, I uh, you know I I pinch myself every day that I'm actually working in the business based on what I hear out of the younger set of players. Mm -hmm. You know, because if I were in this job market um, 25 years ago, I I might be selling shoes because it's. Uh, um, it's uh, the level of playing is is really quite astounding. Um, but you know, I I use that selling shoes thing all the time, and I wonder if shoe salesmen think, man, things are so bad, I'm going to have to go play a little brass instrument. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. They probably sure they do. do. Maybe that can be a poster session at, in Provo. Good idea. Uh, good recall. <laughs> I didn't mean to throw you off. Go back to what you're saying. It's good. No, the thing is this. I think the thing is. The thing is this, you know, you have a lot of kids that, that come in these days that, and I'm sure you probably see it where you live and work too, that are interested in being performance majors. And um, while I never am one to th throw a bucket of water on that, I, I, I have a, a, ex a level of expectation that I have for kids that are going to be performance majors. And I, and I trot this out. I just tell them right up front. I said... Look, I, I'm not going to try and talk you out of being a performance major, but here's the deal. In four years' time, you need to play me under the table because I represent the lowest form of threat that you will find on the audition circuit. <laughs> okay? I am the lowest level of threat. And, and what's really cool is it scares, scares the poop out of some kids, which is you know kind of an intended goal. But for a certain other kind of kid, it makes them go, okay. And frankly, I've had uh, I've had two handfuls of students probably that I think have passed me by leaps and bounds. And as a teacher, does that make me uh, feel threatened? Hell no. That makes me really proud. I mean, you know, I I I love it when students pass me. I I absolutely love it. And I've had I've had students over the years that that are just really exquisite players, just really lovely, lovely, lovely players. And, and so um, I think that there needs to be a certain level of um, pragmatism to what goes into what a student decides to study, but I love the work that you guys are doing in terms of making students think outside of a traditional box in terms of what they can bring to the table. I mean, I think that's with, with your, your, everything that you're doing with the website and, and with, uh, with the presentations that you do leads towards making students think about what they're doing. You know, and I think that for a while, when I was 18 years old, I wasn't thinking about what I was doing, but it's really helpful now to have kind of this awareness in the business that, you know, if, if you're going to make it as a performer, you got to have a lot. You got to wear a ton of different hats, and you've got to wear them all effectively, and you have to wear them all well. And you need to know this going in that this is kind of going to be a realistic expectation of what your career may or may not look like. There you go. You don't have to. You know, you're not getting paid for this. You don't have to say nice <laughs> things about us. Yeah. Wait. We did not I, tell you that. I would. <laughs> Sorry. I would Wait. tell you, well, put it this way, you, you, you don't have to worry about the check bouncing because there's no, because <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no check. <laughs> well, here, we talked, uh, well, here's another sort of philosophical question. Where do you see it going? Where, well, how do you anticipate things changing over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Uh, you know, 
I, that's a great question. Um, Thanks, man. I, I think um, <laughs> I think that eventually the pendulum's got to swing back in terms of. I, I feel like in a lot of ways over the past. Oh, I don't know. Over the past eight, ten years, that um, artist the artistic community has kind of been marginalized. You know, you get, you get lost in all the STEM talk. Uh, Gal, we had a. Well, our provost of the, not a provost, pardon me, our, our chancellor of the university system uh, at the university uh, for the state of Georgia was recently quoted in the paper as saying, you know, they were talking about employment in the state, and they were talking about you know the university as being an economic engine for for making employees for the state, and uh, so he, he came out in the newspaper with a quote that said, there are jobs in Atlanta that just are not being filled by college graduates. And he said, you know why that is? Because people are majoring in the wrong things. If you majored in theater and you can't get a job, well, then perhaps you need to think about that. And I'm like, whoa, (laughs) this is like the head of the highest academic institution in the state. And I was really taken aback uh, by that. But I think that look, man, you look at the news. Uh, If we lose humanity if we lose a sense of humanity and beauty and and p- positivity in the world then well then we're screwed we're screwed and i think that eventually people are going to say you know there is value in the arts there is value in in what happens in the in the music business or what happens in the theater business or what happens in terms of people creating visual art or writing books or writing plays and I think that eventually the pendulum will swing back to where those values will the those things will be valued once again I have to believe that I have to believe it otherwise I I wouldn't sleep at night um, yeah. but uh, I, I hope that um, as far as the music business goes um, I think that there is you do see a little bit of a shift as the as schools or <laughs> schools in the year 2015 are saying, wait, it's not 1950 anymore, and I think that, <laughs> and, and I think that there, there, a lot of schools are shaking up what they're doing with their curriculum. Um, but that changes. You, you guys work at universities. You know how change works. It's pretty slow, and uh, <laughs> and it and it takes resources, uh, many of which have dwindled in the economic downturn, and so it it's it takes an act of courage. Um, for leadership at universities to say, yeah, we're all in on this and we really do need to rethink about training musicians for the 21st century. We have that going on at Georgia. Um, do we have as much of it as, as I would like? Um, uh, I, we could always do better. Um, but I, I hope that that's a trend. I hope that that's a trend that people are, that we start to train people less auto harp and more, um, more computer applications. <laughs> you know? I heard I heard somebody recently um, say that uh, that two two of the uh, two entities in the world that are uh, some of the slowest to change are uh, classical music and academia, <laughs> which is I thought was really apropos because it's just like well yeah that's where that's the convergence of those two is where we all hang out <laughs> so. Uh, it's, uh, I like your analogy of, or just, you know, referencing 1950. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it's easy for the tuba professor to just say, we'll just change. There's obviously, there's a lot of, uh, institutional things that need to happen. Um, what, what, what do you think that, um, what is your advice to your students, um, who you are releasing into the wild in terms of them, um, you know, having the best possible chance to succeed in the music business? Well, I think versatility is is a key. I mean, I think you have to you, you can't be you can't be the best player of the Arbin's book on the planet and 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 plan to have a life in music after that. You know, it's just you need to be able to do a lot of different things. Um, I, I had a fun semester this semester. I I have all the um, admiration in the world for jazz musicians. I um, I think that in in Almost every way, jazz musicians are so much more complete than classical musicians in terms of actually knowing the art and knowing and understanding. Um, um, am I breaking up on you? You're making a face. Nope. Okay. No, All right. I'm, so, no, 
that's his oh, face. Yeah, that's my, that's my, it's just thanks, a little gas. man. I love you too. <laughs> no, it's just a lot of gas. <laughs> no, so I, I really admire, um, I really admire what's going on with jazz, with jazz players, and I think that their understanding of music is greater. So this semester, I finally had enough of a, a hole in my schedule where I could finally audit the, the jazz improv course. And I've wanted to do it for a lot of years. I, I, I really appreciate it. I always feel like I can't do it very well, and, and uh, so I needed to learn a little bit. And I've, th this was like the first little baby step into the, into the uh, waiting pool as far as that goes. But I, I encourage every, I advise grad students and I advise every graduate student that they need to take jazz and prof. If not to, to learn something uh, about playing their instrument, but also to help them with their ear uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and I think you have to be, if you want to be good at anything in the music business, it's very funny. We talk about kind of uh, different skill sets that, that you have to have. And Lance, I think you, you, Lance and Andrew, you both mentioned this when you were down. The very minimum that you need to be able to have to make it in the music business is you must be a great musician. You, you can't, you could be into all the entrepreneurial things in the world, but if you don't have product to back it up, then, then it's, got, it's hollow and it's not going to last. Yes, um, sure. And so, so what my, I feel like my obligation as a teacher is to get students to think at the very highest level that they can about m music as art and, and about what they're doing. And, uh, I, you know, the, the goal is to not have any empty suits, to not have st students who are just holding the instrument, but somebody helping, helping them to find a way to say what they need to say. And I think that those, I think that doors will open if, if you have those skills as a musician. And it's just, fine, it's just finding opportunity. And the thing is that I tell my kids all the time is they, they just have to fail at a lot of different things. You know, you need to, if you want to get good at something, increase your failure rate and, um, and, uh, and don't be afraid of it. Um, I had a student once that, well, I had a student once that would be very excited about seeing a job opening that would come up and then they would, they would talk about it. They would, they would front about it and they'd say, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. I'm getting my materials together. And at the end of the day, the student never applied for the job. And I and after I watched that pattern happen about three times, I said, "Can I ask you a question?" And, and they said, "Yeah." And I said, "Is the reason that you're not applying for these jobs, you're not following through and applying for these jobs, is because you're afraid of being rejected?" And the student said, "Yeah, that's exactly it." I said, "Then you need to do something else. This right. is not. This is. This is not for you. Re rejection is part and parcel of what we do." If I had, a, if you know, if I had a dollar for every time I was rejected when I, for trying to do something I really wanted to do, I'd have a lot of dollars. You know? So <laughs> you're talking about you're so, talking about dating, though, right? <laughs> well, it all it all goes into the same pile. You know? <laughs> right, the rejected pool. So. Uh, <laughs> So speaking of dating, uh, that uh, reminds me of our dear friend Jens Lindemann. I have no idea why. Uh, awkward segue. Uh, as you know, uh, Jens is your You used to date? You, you dated Jens? Uh, yeah, long before uh, he had met Jennifer and I, I had met Tiffany. Yes, uh, it's, it's not, not, that, not that known. So um, the, uh, you play with him in the brass band of Battle Creek, and um, I didn't know if you might have any words of wisdom that you would want to uh, offer Jens um, uh, while he is uh, going through the chop problems. Well, I think he just needs to stick with it. You know, I think that there's a, uh, th there's a silver lining in every cloud. And I think with a little, uh, a, a little, a little hard work, I know we're all praying for him in the band. I mean, we good. are. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, he doesn't know about this yet, but we did take up a collection. So he, <laughs> so he might be able to get a lesson or something. Oh, but, uh, hey, there but, you go. But, but uh, I, you know, I think I, my, my thoughts are with them. And, uh, God, Godspeed, Jens. Godspeed, my friend. You know, you can get, we have Pray for Jens shirts and stickers and onesies <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. So you, you can actually <laughs> find those. Yeah, yeah hook, hook me up with that. If you go to uh, prayforyens.org, then you can you can find all of it there. You really can. 
Uh, that's, and it's true. That's really there. That's really there. I, I would propose actually that you uh, that you send us uh, whatever collections you can uh, muster up so that we can just put that uh, money back towards uh, you know raising awareness. <laughs> that's what I would. That's what I would say, right? <laughs> you guys are so altruistic; it's hard well, to take. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's pedalomedia dot com. We ain't dot org. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, switch it to dot gov. Then the money yeah. will just. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, um, what, uh, is there anything, any other burning issues that you have, uh, did, I mean, issues like, yeah, you want to, do you want to talk about anything? <laughs> Bur- oh, oh God. Oh God. <laughs> oh, the tuba players are back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said burning issues. Uh, <laughs> That's like a double end tendry. <laughs> Oh man, I didn't even go there. That's pretty funny. Uh, well, I did go there. I just didn't realize that I'd gone there. So when you live in that place so frequently that you can go there without even noticing. So uh, that's called being in a road band. All right. Oh, there, you go. there yep. you go. Yep. Um, I think the biggest thing is you know it's it's very funny. You know, I've kind of I've kind of hit a certain age where you kind of you know start thinking about um, start thinking about things, and I just really. Um, Again, I feel so fortunate to to have had the lucky bounces that I've had to have a life in music, and um, and uh, there are some days when I pick up the instrument and I go, "How did this ever happen?" That I got some lucky bounces, and there are other weeks like this week where I'm sitting in this band and and uh, things are happening at a phenomenally high level, and and you, and you just feel really. Uh, proud to be part of something that's that's um, that's at a, it's such a high level, and uh, you know it's um, I, I've had some really lucky bounces that I've had those uh, some some opportunities like that that have uh, and those every time I have an opportunity like that it really fills my bucket. Um, every time I'm playing and I've got the or every time I'm off and I've got the instrument on my face, it's a good day. It's a good day for me because, um, and I don't care if it's the East Cupcake Philharmonic. Um, if I've, if I'm, if I'm sitting there with an instrument on my face and having an opportunity to make music and 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 play, I, I'm always grateful for whatever kind of experience that I have um, because it's all good. I mean, it's all good. There's nothing to bitch about on a gig, okay? Nothing, nothing about on a gig you know and so i as as uh, as the years trudge on and i get more involved with um teaching and and a little bit of playing i, I again i i just feel really um lucky to have even uh landed where i'm where i am so well that's an annoyingly positive spin on life yeah sorry <laughs> Wow! <laughs> I would, Way to bring it up. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I would say we could rap on that, but I. I don't know that. that I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. Uh, <laughs> um, I did want to um, put in a, a plug. Um, well, it's for my website, but it's for your words on my website. Uh, if you go to andrewhits.com and uh, you search uh, for David Zirkel. Uh, there are uh, a number of posts up there. Uh, three of them, uh, I, you came to uh, to George Mason, where I'm on the faculty uh, last, uh, this was in April of 2014, uh, and gave a, uh, a, a master class for the studio and a recital, which both of them were stellar. Um, but the uh, I took uh, a whole bunch of quotes to the point where I had to break it up into three different posts uh, that I put on my blog. Um, and uh, they are absolutely fantastic, uh, not just about uh, tuba, but about uh, wind playing and being a musician in general. Um, so absolutely check those out. Um, you'll, uh, you'll get a whole lot out of that, I promise. And uh, also, um, a, um, I took, uh, with permission, I took a post uh, that, uh, that, that uh, David put up on his Facebook uh, page like as, as a note um, that I uh, called uh, On Choosing College. 
uh, which is absolutely, it's just spot on. If you are a, um, a student who's looking to go to school, um, this could be if you're an undergrad looking for a graduate school. Not that you have no idea what you're looking for, obviously, but, um, uh, but this just the way that you put it. And uh, especially if you're a high school student or the parent of a high school student, uh, he really just breaks it down. I read this and I immediately uh, emailed him and said, "Can I? This needs to be. This needs to exist outside of just Facebook. Can I post this? Uh, you know, on my blog?" And and he said, "Absolutely." So, uh, be sure to check uh, all of that out. And um, I know that you can. You have a your studio has a website, right? At uga tuba youth dot com. Yeah, it's, it, it's uga tuba youth dot com. And uh, and I've got there are some clips of the studio playing. And there's some clips of me playing and some essays and stuff that I wrote. I, I, uh, I, I, you know, people often ask me, what, what would you, what would you have done if you weren't a two, if you didn't go into music? And I don't really have a great answer for that. You know, I wanted to be a meteorologist. Maybe there was a period in my life where I wanted to be a herpetologist who was a snake doctor. And there was, you know, it's, it's just crazy, crazy <laughs> stuff. That was like 12. That was 12. I had hair to the middle of my back and I was, uh, I don't know what I was tripping on. But anyway, I thought that I wanted to be a snake doctor. So anyway, um, so any, people say, well, what would you want to do? And I would say, well, I, I wish that I could do something with writing because if somebody gives me a topic to write about, I love to write. Um, and, uh, and frankly, I, I would like, I'd like to pay somebody to give me a weekly topic of something to write about and, and then, and then actually sit down and write because it's, it's therapeutic for me. And, uh, and uh, I, I enjoy it very much. So there's a couple essays on the website and uh, some information about the studio at UGA. Great. I can't gonna... shake this snake doctor thing. is stuck in my head now. Yeah, well, I want you to roll with that for a little while. <laughs> and if you have any questions, call me. I prefer, we prefer <laughs> to leave the, the interviews like kind of um, unsettling rather than that uplifting <laughs> crap that you were shoveling a few minutes ago. So, so this is... <laughs> This is much, 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 much better. Everyone's just can wait. Was what, what was he talking about? Yeah, I, I've never met anyone who wanted to be a snake doctor. You should ask. Um, stunned him. Yeah, we did. We did <laughs> stun him. <laughs> his, yeah, his, unfortunately, he just was attacked by a his, snake, <laughs> and now he is his, unable to speak. His Skype, oh wait, he's coming back now. Oh, his Skype was completely frozen. Uh, oh, and you missed a great line. So. Oh, uh, I sure, bet, uh, yeah, yeah, sure yeah, we did. Yeah, too. sure yeah. we did. Yeah. yeah, you're just realizing that you peaked five minutes into this interview. So, yeah, now he's, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly technology robbed us from some gem. Yeah, right. So, um, all right. Well, I think that that, is, that about does it. Uh, Lance, do you have anything else? Dave Zirkle, Snake Doctor. <laughs> Dave, yeah. It sounds my, like my, a... My, is it, my line is that's just not a, it's not a euphemism. It's really a thing being a snake doctor. That, that sounds like a really <laughs> sounds like a really <laughs> horrible TV show. <laughs> David Zirkel, snake doctor. <laughs> Martha Quinn, medicine woman. Da uh, <laughs> Doctor Zirkel, we have an inc incredibly <laughs> sick cobra. <laughs> Can you get here in time? <laughs> Stat. Stat. Yeah, of course. That's the medical term I guess they use for snake emergencies as well so, <laughs> all right <laughs> oh, there you go thank you very it. much people i'll be here yeah now it is time to shut it down so <laughs> well thank right, you <laughs> thank, thank you. you yeah of course thank you to to professor zirkel um you were very articulate in spite of not having a doctorate and um and uh, thank you, as always, to Lance. He had those two really insightful questions in a row uh, in the middle. We should have cut him off at that point because uh, it was always down. Always, it was always downhill from words. Good. Me talk good. Yeah, me talk good. It's okay. I'm a professional podcaster, whatever that means. So, all right, that will uh, do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. <laughs> You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. 
Also, be sure to check out our latest recording, The Brass Recording Project, at BrassRecordingProject.com. The Brass Junkies is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producers are Andrew Hitz and Lance LaDuke. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. Thank you.